bastards from Moldova. They think they can walk into another man's home and steal his business. There's a convoy of arms coming in from the west soon. You smash it, yeah? In return, I'll make some new ordnance available to you. Welcome back to Frank's Penance. This is going to be a slightly different episode to usual. Basically, it's to do with what I hinted at in the description of the last episode, which is that the story that I have planned for Frank, his backstory, is uh, much longer than I think the game has remaining. We're basically halfway through the game, and we're not halfway through the story I planned. So, I mentioned we might have to do some catch-up episodes, which are mostly just the story. So I'm going to do one of those right now, in fact, because I think we are going to need it. So this footage does take place right after the end of the last episode. Basically, I'm going out to do side missions. So all the footage is from side missions. You'll notice that I suck. I'm actually uh, watching TV with headphones on whilst playing this because the side missions aren't very interesting. But I did want to do them because it unlocks weapons and it unlocks, uh, sorry, it gives you money to use those unlocked weapons, which may be helpful for the regular missions. So we are going to hear a big chunk of Frank's backstory, which means if you are watching this show mainly for the gameplay you can pretty much skip this episode uh, you can also even not watch the episode because the footage isn't going to be important or relevant to the main thrust of the game you just need to listen to it basically so this is the frank's penance podcast essentially so without further ado let's get going and next time we'll move on to the next actual missions with frank's story in south mali I slowly melted in the sun while slotting bullets into magazines that only seemed to fit properly about half the time. When it was all done, the weapons were concealed back into the piles of football shirts and returned to the hold. Surprisingly, only a couple of them actually went off while moving the crates, giving the young Spanish lad a bit of a close shave. Good thing Co was around to kiss it better with his vodka and get the lad to stop whining with a barrage of cussing. Days went by and I started to regret my decisions less and less. Sure, I still wished I could go back to those days in Garrison and start all over again, but half the people in the world wish for stuff like that, so I wasn't exactly worthy of sympathy. One obediently bright morning, we set eyes on Sevastopol, running our way through a cascade of other craft, bigger and smaller than us, scurrying to and from the port. Most of us gathered on the deck as the ship chugged into port. Co pointed out to us every smuggling ship he knew docked alongside us. He said that they were probably all working on going to exactly the same place as we were, Chechnya. The big reveal meant nothing to me, as I'd never heard of it. All I knew was it must be some place a whole lot more fucked up than Ireland to have the nearest harbour be rammed full of shady arms dealers trying to find themselves a sold-out map to this profitable dead zone. Co had already phoned ahead, our dock was clear, and a convoy of trucks was set ready to take our cargo. So then came the work of lugging the crates to shore and putting them aboard the roasting juice and a halfs. The insides of those things smelled like rot and death, probably with good reason. As we worked, I tried to get some intel from Rourke about this Chechnya place. He explained it in terms I could understand. He said it was basically the same deal as Ireland, but ten times worse. They too were struggling with an overbearing empire, this time the Russians. But their struggle had run so deep that now every man, child and dog was gearing up for a full-scale rebellion or Russian convict crewed tanks lined up at the border. It seemed like I was about to be humbled by the plight of a people truly oppressed. I knew a fair bit about Russian history, but not much about what was going on now. Rourke said he'd heard from some of the Turks in our crew that Russia were much more liberal than the Brits when it came to deciding how much lethal force to use when ruling a nation. The whole time we were loading weapons, we were in plain view of the passers-by and the dock foreman who'd come over to pretend to inspect our shipment. Co busied himself telling the foreman how he should expect to receive his cut of the tape. A few people came over to greet some of our guys. Despite being a giant city, Sevastopol still had the kind of culture where everyone tried to know everyone else. Kinda dodgy, given we were up to no good. But the city was also the kind of place where the police saw the futility of preventing businessmen like ourselves from operating. Besides, we were probably good for the economy. Once it was all good to go, Co came over and started dishing out new orders. A handful of us were to go with him and the vehicles to the sail point, including me. Everyone else was going to sail to North Africa, where he'd already arranged the next pickup of stock. Rourke was in the latter group, so we said our brief goodbyes and parted ways. In theory, I was going to see him again, but I'll let you guess how the theory holds up. 
I remember Rourke as being a great guy, but that might have just been because I wasn't around him long enough to see past his facade and realise what darkness he worshipped. Ko summoned me over. I was going to be riding with him. Couldn't work out if that was good or bad at first, but really he just wanted someone new to talk to, since the drive we were about to make was damn long and damn desolate. Our convoy of four trucks set off, forcing our way out through the heavy traffic of the city and slipping out onto an open highway headed east. Our trucks blended in fairly well with the rest of the beaten up vehicles sunken low on their worn out suspension. At first, Ko didn't really say anything, aside from asking me to check his map but he seemed to know where he was going. Eventually, after a period of steady driving on the east road, he looked over and asked me if I've ever killed anyone. I was shocked by the sudden question, but was quick to say no. It was the answer I wanted to say, but in truth my actions had directly or indirectly led to people being killed, so it wasn't an honest one. Something told me that I needed to be honest with Ko, and in fact yes was the answer he was looking for, so I made a quick turnabout and admitted the truth. Ko said I didn't look like the type who had killed someone. That was probably because I was forcing myself to not feel bad about it. He was happy with the answer though. Good to have a killer's mind as a trick up your sleeve, he said. It seemed like Ko might be letting me on to the fact that killing might end up being part of the job description in our current jaunt. I asked Ko again when exactly I was free to leave his service. Once they got back to Sevastopol, he said, just like we'd agreed before. I was worried he was going to press gang me into service forever, but his business-like tone put me at ease. I really was just hired help to him, and he didn't care if I died, disappeared, stayed or married him. But, Ko continued to say, if I was to leave him, I was going to be stuck in an unfamiliar land on my own, without a word of the local language in my brain and probably not enough sense to avoid getting played by the local gangs. Staying with his crew offered some kind of safety, that was clear. But the whole reason I was out here, the whole reason I left everything in Ireland behind, was to start my life down a different path. Running with armed smugglers probably wasn't going to get me to this mythical life, but lying in the streets of Sevastopol probably wasn't either. I was starting to see why upping stakes without a plan and starting all over again wasn't so appealing after all. So he laid out the offer that if I did well on this job, I could stay with the crew. That meant I could still team up with Rourke, which was appealing, but I knew that Rourke had become exactly the type of person I was desperately trying not to be, so it wasn't exactly aligned with my personal reasons for being out there on that dusty mountain road. But those very mountains were almost telling me something about the world through their jagged edges and unforgiving plummets. This world that I lived in was one where to become a warrior, to become a selfish cutthroat living to survive at any cost, was normal, exactly what the world was meant for. Maybe I was just trying to justify my dark thoughts to myself, but it sure as hell seemed like my hand was being forced and my life was destined to take me into Rourke's boots and beyond. I wondered whether being a guy like Ko was the next step from being a hired trigger finger. Didn't really want to ask him for a life story, but Ko had other plans. He was going to fill this long drive with a gush of backstory that I later discovered he did to all the new guys. He'd started out as a straight walking soldier in the British military, not what I expected at all. He had served a few uneventful years before he began to have his philosophical disagreements with the British military doctrine and got out. But once on the outside, it had turned out that most of the skills you learn as a grunt in the army aren't very useful to anyone. The other former bottom rankers he knew had all got into standard daily grind roles that could have been done by a kid. Ko proudly recalled that he refused to stand for a life like that. As we passed a few broken down buses surrounded by overheating travellers, Ko told me that he'd decided to start his own business, a business where the many practical skills he had learned in the training camps could be turned to make a profit. When you're taught the ways of violence, he added, there isn't much else you can do to be happy. It was a way of life. It was part of your character that someone couldn't deny. It was like an echo of what Rourke had said back on the boat, and an echo of my deepest personal fear. I zoned out of his story and rushed to some introspective analysis. Was I too ingrained with violence to escape it? Once a soldier, always a soldier, Ko quipped, taking a knowing look over at me. The skills that are forged in fire in places like this are ones you never forget, he said, and that you'll always feel unfulfilled if you don't exercise them. Well, I was pretty damn tired of unfulfillment by that point of my life. I could see where Ko was going with this, but he decided to make it obvious by just telling me. 
he saw that I was treading the path to becoming him. He said that if I ever wanted to straighten out and become normal, I had to do it sooner rather than later, since it was only going to get harder and harder until it was virtually impossible. So maybe I didn't want to stay with the smugglers after all. I didn't even know what I wanted anymore. I was getting simultaneous advice slash lectures from the back of my head, the sticky guy in the seat next to me, and from my memory. Memories of the last few warnings my mother had dared to give me. But right then it was the lecture from Ko that was loudest. He was saying that he'd known a lot of people who'd spent years in the smuggling game, or the army game, or the merc game, and had tried to set their life straight after one too many close calls but it made them miserable. They were tormented by the call of the life they had previously built for themselves, and daunted by the prospect of starting from the bottom in the real world, where most people never achieve anything. I asked him what happened to people like that, asked whether they went back to their games. Ko laughed and shook his head, saying there were plenty of other ways to deal with misery, most of them just as dangerous as going back. The secret formula was to get drunk, watch TV, and ignore your own existence which he said he would never let himself do, how principled. I could appreciate what those guys must have felt like, since the memories of the IRA fights, memories of being under deadly pressure and coming out on top, they constantly resurfaced and made me feel strange. A good strange. I guess you could call it nostalgia, only mixed with a power trip. And sure enough, once the memory had played out, I would be thinking about my current lot and experience a moment of intense disappointment and regret. Part of me wanted to be my younger self again, but luckily I still had enough sense to break open some logic and convince myself out of that viewpoint every time. Problem was people sometimes act on impulse, and the majority shareholder of my impulses was the side of me that brought tears to my mother's sunken eyes. Every time the thoughts resurfaced they became more normal, and my subconscious found it easier and easier to justify these thoughts in the context of how the world was. Jesus, that whole drive was one big emotional wrestling match, with Ko throwing chairs into the ring. The drive itself had taken us out of the endless sea of crop fields of Crimea, through a few forgotten towns full of junk, and across the sea by ferry into a greener land where mountains towered over the horizon. After a rough night in the trucks, we kept driving through this land where the signs were covered in something Russian looking beneath the grime, and roads faded into muddy tracks winding through the highland mazes. Co claimed we were nearly there. Soon enough, we passed a new looking sign that Co claimed said Chechnya on it. Just a name, but I was about to discover the true implications of that word. Co had a map that he constantly checked as we wound through the hills, finally reaching a proper road that increased our pace. The mountain mist began to lift to reveal far reaching views of yet more mountains and bluffs. We passed a few more towns, this time cleaner but pretty much deserted. Everyone was on edge, waiting for something to kick off with the Russians, who were supposedly waiting across the northern border. It was nothing like the mood in Ireland. These people were waiting for total war to break out, not just an insurgency. Next we travelled north into the middle of nowhere. The land flattened out until it was flatter than I'd ever seen. The road was dead straight, just like the horizon in all directions. This featureless place was what Coe called the Steppe. Eventually hills grew in the distance which supposedly housed our destination. It was a town with an unreadable name where actually people were bustling about everywhere. Half the buildings were boarded up and the streets were covered in mud which turned out to be what half the roads were constructed of, forcing our weighty convoy to a crawl. Co explained that these people didn't live here. They had gathered from dozens of surrounding towns and villages to meet arms traders like ourselves. He was delighted to see that it appeared we were the first convoy out of Sevastopol to arrive. His competitors were undoubtedly on the way, so he wanted to close the deals quick. The crowds cheered as we pushed open the heavy van doors. Guitars were playing somewhere in the street, but they were quickly drowned out by the shouting as Ko, who seemed to speak a little of a local lingo, started trying to get orderly lines in place. We took ward after ward of cold hard cash as he passed out the loaded weapons. Shots were fired into the air and people cheered. They were so happy to get a chance to fight, it made me feel uncomfortable. What was their life like here? Were they all just like the younger me, unaware of what it really meant to be in a gunfight? Once everything was empty, the crowd moved away. Those not lucky enough to bag a weapon this time went to sit on anything they could find nearby to await the next delivery. Co gathered us all up to make sure we hadn't pocketed any of the money. 
He took it all himself and then sat in the back of one of the trucks organising it, while we stood around in the mud looking awkwardly at each other and the locals. There was a tense atmosphere, but I couldn't work out why, which pretty much meant I didn't understand what was going on. Turned out the others were afraid of the Russians. They said the whole town could be firebombed at any moment, and they didn't want to be around for that. I thought the idea that they could so calmly accept that this whole town was going to be wiped out without saying a thing to the residents was so damn weird. I expect the residents themselves knew it deep down inside, but their communal spirit flamed by the hope that they could still fight hid most of the doom. I think right then my internal chaos was finding a solution. I felt like if I could help these people then I'd be doing something people would appreciate. At the same time, the edgy atmosphere and high chance I'd end up in a fight made that impulsive desire to keep the old power trip going go wild. That's why when Ko reappeared from the truck to give us each our cut of the cash haul, I told him I would stay with them for the next run. If he really cared about my well-being as he almost had done on the ride over, he probably would have refused, but instead he laughed, shook my hand and said he'd been hoping I'd make that choice. One other guy who was new did the same, although Ko didn't seem to care. So with our pockets now stuffed with cash, Ko beckoned us back into the trucks for the return journey. Two days on the road and we'd only spent half an hour at our destination, but that half an hour probably decided the fate of half the town. As we rolled out, the sky was roaring with the sound of military jets above the clouds. Luckily no bombs dropped. On the edge of town, some of the people we sold weapons to were setting up a checkpoint and two guys were digging foxholes beside the road. They were preparing for full-on war. Ko commented that what these people had planned was the true meaning of war and that the IRA deal in Ireland could only be called resistance in comparison. Seemed like he was right. I asked him to tell me about this war and what it was all about. Ko laughed the question off. He didn't know shit about it. He just said that the people around here were fierce and determined to win freedom from a ruler who commanded a professional military. A brutal war seemed pretty likely in which both sides were going to suffer horribly, but the important part was that both sides wanted guns and he had the contacts to make it happen. I didn't like his business-like way of saying it, I was already feeling a growing sympathy for the people, as if they would only be saved if I was fighting for them. A delusion probably fed by my remaining belief that glory and honour, as defined by war propaganda, was something that would make me admired, especially when everyone seemed to have a stake in the fight. It was just a guilty dream then, but it wouldn't be forever. I asked Ko if he was really okay with helping the Russian side. He was quick to explain that it wasn't his place to judge, he was just a neutral party here selling goods and nothing else. Kind of made sense, but I still didn't like it. He said that that's part of being a smuggler, a good one anyway. You never ask where the goods came from or what they're going to be used for. You are a link in the chain with no business up or downstream. I admitted I felt like that would be hard, and Ko said it was because I was still somewhat normal. He said it would fade over time, but that this bastion of normality I had somewhere meant there was a chance I could get out of the game. Back to that topic again. I couldn't work out whether he was trying to warn me, trying to get rid of me, or just saying stuff and not giving a damn whether I listened or not. I got the feeling that Ko, part of him anyway, wanted to be normal again. He was going to live out his fantasies of normality through me, assumably. <laughs> I didn't like to think about it. So Long Boring Journey version 2 began. We got through the flat bit, turning west back into the hilly bit, moving towards the highways leading back towards Ukraine. We had just finished the ferry crossing at Kirsch, taking us from Russian territory back into Ukraine, when Ko suddenly got a call on a mobile phone he had jammed into his rucksack. The voice on the other end said a few words and Ko went berserk. I tried to listen to what it was saying, but didn't have much luck. Whoever he was talking to, he told them to meet him in Sevastopol ASAP. Once the conversation was over, Ko punched the dashboard, leaving a fracture, and then radioed the other trucks to halt. He said our boat had been hijacked while collecting weapons in North Africa, but some of the crew were in town at the time and evaded capture. I didn't want to ask if Rourke was among them, feeling that that would only seem overly caring in the face of Ko's rage. He gathered everyone up at the back of the truck again and let us all know the situation. He didn't seem convinced anyone was going to make it back to Sevastopol, probably because it was easier to join another smuggling crew wherever they were. Besides, why come back to a crew who just lost their most expensive asset? 
At the time, I was a little taken aback at his lack of faith, but in retrospect, he was perfectly correct. It seemed fate might be pushing me out of the smuggler's life after all, but Ko quickly dispelled the theory with a daring plan of action. He said that when the world takes something from you, you must take it back in any way you can. He pulled the floor panel out of the truck to reveal a small extra weapons cache which he wordlessly handed out. Everyone looked at each other, wondering who was going to end up dead in the near future because of this setback. I guess some of them probably considered going rogue and quitting Ko's service, but they kept listening. Perhaps Ko's apparent initiative was enough of a display of leadership to keep their trust. Once the weapons were handed out, Ko went back to the stash and pulled out more wads of money. As he started handing out the cut of the lost crew, he openly said that the money was in exchange for following his exact orders for the rest of the day. He had something big planned. As the last piece of valuable paper was dispensed, he pointed to a hill in the distance that our lonely road skirted around. He said that soon more convoys from Sevastopol would be coming around that hill just as we had two days before. If the crew was going to get the money to keep the operation going, we would need to take the cargo, sell it and invest the profits back into our supply line. From there, he said, we wouldn't need a boat. We could just buy the weapons from sea smugglers in the ports and do the dirty work of getting them to the front line, especially because once the war heated up, most regular smugglers would think twice about getting too close to the battle lines. It seemed he had planned this idea for a while and stashed it away for a rainy day. Hearing this plan, for me, was something special. This decisive action fueled me up for a fight. A good leader can make a killer out of anyone, and I wasn't exactly distant from that position already. I couldn't wait to turn a quick profit by violence and reap the rewards. Suddenly I was totally invested in the smuggling crew, or at least invested in Co. Everyone else was less enthusiastic, but the stacks of cash in their pockets reminded them that doing what Ko says has been a good idea in the past, so they went along with the plan for now. Only a couple of them held the weapons like they'd actually used them before, but I expect Ko had already factored in their lack of skill to his plan. Their obvious anxiety made me feel even better. I had battle experience, meaning suddenly I was one of the crew's leading men in its darkest hour. I was needed. My skills, learned from countless military manuals and IRA escapades as a teenager, were valued above those of all others. The whole incident basically told me that this was all I wanted, to be needed, to be respected for my rare abilities. It was a welcome relief from the week of self-doubt, a drug hit on my power trip that would prove to be a little too addictive. We drove over to the solitary hill and took the trucks over the crest, out of sight from the road. The tyre tracks were pretty obvious, but not in themselves suspicious. There were a few campers on the hidden hillside who we quickly scared away. Co revealed one more trick from our truck, a light machine gun complete with stand and ammunition belts, which he set up on the crest overlooking the road, using the sparse vegetation to conceal himself a little. His plan was to open fire if the holdup went sour. He told me that if push came to shove, I shouldn't be afraid to kill someone. Well, I was a little afraid, actually. It was one thing to kill an enemy in battle, but to mug someone on behalf of your business and kill them for not complying seemed worthy of a lower circle of hell. But it seemed Co was the new Fergal, as I just nodded and let my scruples fade on request. So, with Co on Overwatch, the rest of us hung around at the roadside acting casual, hoping no do-good police would stop by to interfere. It was boiling hot, so I just sat beneath a tree and even found myself relaxing. I was far from my troubles in Ireland, and even though the troubles here were more intense, they seemed to all be under control. Co was going to do the work for me. I would no longer be responsible for my own actions or destiny. I would just get rich while trying to make sure our smuggling helped the Chechens more than the Russians, an ongoing good turn to justify my existence. It was a crazy kind of happiness I had on that quiet afternoon. I'll let you guess how long that crazy happiness lasted for, based on past precedent. I'll even give you a hint. It was over about five minutes after the convoy we were going to rob was spotted on the horizon. So that's all for now, but of course there is more from Frank's story in the Ukraine and Chechnya and more from his story in South Mali, which will be coming up very soon. So I hope you'll join me for that next time on Frank's Penance. Thank you.